The real learning lesson came after I began asking for post-mortem meetings with customers who rejected our bid. By the way, if you don't regularly ask for these meetings, you are missing out on a great opportunity to learn from the only people whose opinion really matters. The key is focusing them and you on why you lost, but avoid the temptation to relitigate their decision. Welcome to the Food for Thought Lunch Break with Steve Bookbinder podcast, the show that gives you things to think about when you're trying to make more sales without all the seriousness of conventional sales talks. Enjoy and learn as he makes fun of sales training, salespeople, and sales trainers, including himself, all while giving you battle-tested strategies that work. Now, here's your host, Steve Bookbinder. Hey, thanks for joining me on your break. I'm always looking for ways to get more sales easier. Turning your break into a coaching break is a great way for me to help you get more sales easier too. In our last two coaching sessions, we uncovered several surprising truths about selling. For example, it turns out that the sale is really between the customer and their co-worker, not the seller and the customer talking in a vacuum. Coaching is between your outside coach and your inside coach, not simply about having a great coach for a boss. And today, we'll get the most surprising sales miscalculation. Closing a big sale has more to do with your own reaction to your price than the customer's reaction. There are lots of people who can give you strategies and tactics and habits needed to close big sales. My suggestions and my workshop content is to follow the best practices which I personally observe working, working for me and my clients. But none of those strategies will work for you until you first change your personal monetary weak spot. That is your feelings about the amount of money you're asking for. Here's my weak spot story. Years ago, during my first year in sales, I closed my first big deal. At the time, the team's average contract was approximately $10,000 and half of the deals were close to $5,000. And then one day, I closed a huge $40,000 deal. Well, at the time, 40000 was more than my salary, more than the amount of money I had in the bank, more than my credit limit on my credit card. By comparison to my other numbers, 40000 was a big, scary number. A few days later, at a team meeting, our bookkeeper pointed out to me that all I needed to do was close another deal just like that one every month. And if I did... And then they started doing the math to show me how much money I could possibly make if I did that. Some part of me, maybe several parts of me, were sure I wanted that income, but more parts of me were even more sure I was lucky to get that one exceptionally big deal. I'll never close a deal that big monthly. Why was I so sure about that? And why am I so sure now that we all feel that way about a particular size deal. Despite my being so sure then, I was wrong. I was basing my feelings on fear. The reason I'm so sure now about how everyone is touched by this fear is because I see the evidence in the thousands of pipelines I review, some filled with outrageously unrealistic opportunities, but even very few of those are big sales. Also, because I now read so much, which gives me a chance to learn through the eyes of people much smarter than me. For this topic, I recommend reading The Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Ecker. According to his book, all of us develop a relationship with money as children that continues to affect us throughout our lives. I see this tendency most strongly in salespeople. Based on his book and my observations, most salespeople have a monetary weak spot number when it comes to asking for a budget. Below our monetary weak spot feels like a reasonable number and and therefore more comfortable to ask for. But uh, above it, 
feels like a, a much bigger number that's hard for the salesperson to ask for simply because the number is so big. What is your number? Our mission in today's lunchtime coaching break is for you to identify your monetary weak spot number and eliminate it or at least raise it before it sabotages your next big sale. Today, we'll discuss how to identify and overcome the effects of our personal monetary weak spot. Then, I'll suggest four strategies you can use this week to close a big sale. And I'll tell you about next week's coaching session. Next week, we'll expand on this conversation and focus on closing the right amount of big deals, as well as average and small deals, each month, a practice called pipeline management. Lots to cover. Let's get started, as we always do, by asking today's question. Are you afraid of success? Most people want to answer this question with a quick, Me? Afraid of success? No, not me. By the way, being afraid of success is a common sales condition, and not recognizing that about yourself is the most common symptom. Here are five test questions you can ask yourself to determine the truth, and some tips if you are. Question one. Have you ever received new leads, but held off on calling one of them because you thought you weren't ready and didn't want to screw up the lead until the right time? Question two. When you think about your first outreach to a lead, whether it's a new business lead or a customer looking for you to upsell them something, do you always call low or midway but never start at the top? Question three. When prospects and customers ask about the budget needed for additional services, do you ever want to say a number to get their reaction, but instead hold off saying anything about the price until you are more sure they'll react positively? Question four. When you imagine hitting your goals for bringing in more revenue this year than last year, are you visualizing closing more sales or fewer bigger sales. Question five. Do you track big sales in your pipeline, but rarely do anything to change the number of big sales in your pipeline? If you answered yes to some or all of these questions, you may have a personal monetary weak spot. So what do you do about it? The simplest thing is a two-step process. The first part is the relatively easy part. That's the part that you admit that either consciously or unconsciously, you are avoiding big sales. That's what fear does to us. It keeps making us think there's something other than fear that's stopping us. The second part sounds like it would be a lot easier, but for most of us, it's harder. It's the part where you confront your fear, literally talking back to your fear, pointing out that you deserve a big sale and earn the right to ask for a big budget. My confrontation with myself and my own fears about big sales began when I started competing for deals through an RFP process or a tender offer. I was sure that the only buying criteria was price and therefore made myself busy trying to shave off money, keeping the total under some imagined line in the sand that I assumed the customer drew, like offering 39000 to be below the dreaded 40000 only to come in behind the winner who was charging $75,000 or more. Why was the other seller allowed to believe they were worth 75000 Who told me I wasn't worth the same? Well, it turns out no one really told me to keep my prices under the radar. I was the one who was telling myself. The real learning lesson came after I began asking for post-mortem meetings with customers who rejected our bid. By the way, if you don't regularly ask for these meetings, you are missing out on a great opportunity to learn from the only people whose opinion really matters. The key is focusing them and you on why you lost, but avoid the temptation to relitigate their decision. What I learned is that the impression I was trying to communicate about how empathetic I am to the client's needs and how comprehensive my solution is, is not the message they received. Often, I had the lowest price and the customer 
while not sharing the actual winning purchase price, would let me know that I was on the low end of the price uh, scale, and they interpreted that as the low end of the comprehensiveness of my solution, but not in those words. The bottom line, because everyone else's prices were higher, in some cases a lot higher, it made my offer look more limited or somehow unproven versus my competitors, who were somehow communicating their solution was more proven, more comprehensive, more valuable, and therefore costs more than mine. Can we change not only our bid pricing, but ourselves? Can we change our own tendency to shy away from big deals? If you learn nothing else from me, learn this. You can change. You can't change your DNA, but you can change your reaction to stress. And nothing is more stressful than trying to top last year every year. To change my reaction to stress, I tell myself, why shouldn't I charge a fair price for the value I'm delivering? And no matter how undeserving me and my company are, we are no more undeserving than our competitors because... Unlike them, we are going to put in two times the budget in service, whereas the competitor is only going to give the customer what they asked for. After that self-talk, reminding myself that added value services are what make my offering as valuable or more than anyone else's, I'm confident that when I'm pricing a big deal with a big price tag, it's a fair and reasonable price for the value. Extra service helps me overcome the effects of my personal monetary weak spot, and it's my strategic advantage competitively. Extra service works for a salesperson the way daily advertising works for an always crowded restaurant. It keeps the restaurant crowded, which is the number one way to maintain your pricing integrity. Ironically, many salespeople think like the empty restaurant with no budget to advertise. They are unconsciously sending out messages that they are not worth it. Like when we minimize our time, call me anytime, rather than ask for a specific time that works for you, or minimize our price, hmm, let me see if I could talk to my boss into extending a discount to you. Don't we realize that the customer hears those phrases and now assumes we're not that busy, which may explain why we're so quick to discount? Let's summarize. You should look at the value of everything in your pipeline to see if you have any or enough big deals. And if you don't, you need to ask yourself, are you simply going after the wrong kinds of leads to get big deals? Or are you afraid to present a big budget offer? Realize that one of the most effective ways to consistently reach your monthly and quarterly goal is by raising the overall average value of your entire pipeline by selectively including a few big deals. Here are four things you could do this week to search and destroy your personal monetary weakness number. A. Find ways to learn what your competitors charge and the level of service they deliver for that budget. Your price isn't inherently too high or too low. It's in comparison that we learn what the quote-unquote right price really is. B. Script your ROI statement. Pick a target company, ideally your next big deal, potentially big deal, then consider all of the benefits of your offering as well as your service level And now, script your ROI pitch. C. Role play practice performing this pitch live, in person, even if you end up delivering it over the phone. The reason is that when you're really in the same room with another person, you use all of your body language to help you communicate your points in the most clear and persuasive way. By practicing that body language in rehearsal, you will still use it on the phone and, as a result, sound more persuasive. And D, maintain that positive role play energy by making an appointment for next week's coaching session. That session will build on this one. Next time, we will discuss how to reduce risk by adapting a pipeline-driven mindset. 
The risk of never having a big sale is that you are counting on a lot of small sales to close, usually requiring a high closing ratio. The risk is that you don't get enough leads each month or don't convert enough of them fast enough to make each month's goal. Less risky is having a few big, a few average, and a few small deals close each month, and ideally the right blend of each for you to hit your aggressive goals with less risk of something going wrong. Wait, you say. If you could do that, you could manage the process of making more sales easier, right? Right. The system I will show you next week works for me personally and every client I work with globally. I'll show you how it works and how to get it to work for you. Until next time, remember, I'm Steve Bookbinder, your sales coach. Thanks for sharing your break with me. Please check out our training specials for individuals and teams on our website, dmtraining.net. Also, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Send an email or email to steve at dmtraining.net if I can help you and your team make more sales. Thank you for listening to Food for Thought. To get your free sales playbook, visit dmtraining.net forward slash podcast. And be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss any of Steve's jokes and helpful resources. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next week.